interesting video. It was actually a question that was sent to me via the Seriously Series website. Now, the gentleman in question had one question. What do I need to look for when I'm buying a Land Rover Parenti? Now, this is an interesting question because depending on where you buy it from to begin with is going to affect or particularly determine the kind of vehicle you're going to purchase. So I'm going to share with you some of the tips, some of the tricks, and some of the things that I've found over the six years of owning this Parenti and from what I've learnt from others in the process. So it should be a good, interesting and informative video as always. So you know exactly what to do. Stay tuned. Rightio. So, the first question is, where on earth do you buy one of these from? Now, here in Australia, and these are, I believe, being sold overseas, but we'll just keep it Australian Pacific at the moment, or specific. Basically, you can't buy one of these shock horror from a Land Rover dealership, no. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the company that's in charge of selling off these vehicles along with a number of other pieces of Australian hardware or military hardware is Frontline Machinery. And Frontline Machinery works with a number of other subsidiary auction houses right throughout the great continent of Australia. These in particular being Grays Online and Pickles. There's probably other ones but they're the two key ones that I know of. Now, if you want to find out where the nearest auction is to you, basically you just need to type into Dr. Google Frontline Machinery, go on their website, and there's a list there of actually where the next auctions are and obviously what companies they're through, whether it's Pickles or Grays Online. So that's basically how you could say a way of buying it direct, directly off the Australian military or the Australian Defence Force. The other option that we have is there is a plethora of these basically on Gumtree, car sales and other I guess classified websites uh, on the internet. Now the difference between the two is I think considerable because if you're buying this at an auction obviously you can't take it for a test drive but you're buying it directly off the Australian Army. Whereas if you are buying it through a private sale, there's a certain risk associated with that too. Now the risk associated with that is you don't know what's happened to the vehicle since it's been bought from the auction or an auction to the time in which you're now looking at purchasing it. And people can't help themselves and I'm not judging, I'm very much the same too as you can see with this vehicle. We can't help ourselves by tailoring and modifying these vehicles to our personal needs. So this is something you have to be wary of because there's a lot of good ways of doing it but there's a lot of bad ways of doing it and particularly when it comes to the mechanics of the vehicle you need to be probably a little bit extra careful. In regards to buying one at an auction house one of the things that you need to look out for is obviously making sure that the overall condition of the vehicle is pretty good uh, you've obviously got a log book, which I'll show you and talk about later on in the video. But they're, they're probably the two methods or the two ways that you could actually look at purchasing one of these vehicles. But anyway, we'll move around to the front here because there's a few other things that you need to look out for and be mindful of in regards to registering the vehicle, but also some of the new legislation that's having an effect on these vehicles directly. Now, this one, Obviously, I bought it in 2015, so quite a few moons ago, and things have changed in regards to regulations. 
When I bought this, all I had to do was remove the back seats because it's an FFR and there's two little uh, dicky seats in the back. So I just had to take those out and it was fine. But nowadays, obviously, government bureaucracy and all the rest has changed things. So these helicopter points at the front tend to be cut off. So that's one of the things to look out for, depending on what state you're in. You might say, well, that's not a big deal. Well, it isn't, but it means that you're going to actually have to fit recovery points to the actual vehicle because the standard recovery points have been cut off because these were originally registered as a commercial vehicle and the legislation between a commercial vehicle and a civilian vehicle is very, very different. So that's one of the things you need to look for there. Uh, tool mounts are another one too. Some states, some regions, you have to take them off. Others, you don't. Uh, I haven't, but these are things that you wanna ask about when you pick up the vehicle. Do they still have them? You know, yes, you might not be able to use them, but for prosperity and down the track, these are gonna become very, very hard to obtain. And you wanna keep all those original parts with the vehicle too, because these are a really, really unique vehicle. The hitch or the helicopter points on the rear are another one that tends to get cut off. Um, jerry can holders, they tend to be okay. But basically, from my understanding, it's trying to get the vehicle back to sort of a standard configuration to a defender or county. And that's sort of the legislation behind it. The maintenance in regards to these vehicles is usually pretty good, but we'll go into the vehicle and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that underneath the bonnet. Rightio, the bowels of the beast. Now, as many of you have seen on the channel, we've done a walk around video in regards to this vehicle. We've done a unique 4x4 uh, episode in regards to it. So I'm just gonna whiz over the motor pretty quickly. Uh, obviously, we've got a 4BD1 Isuzu diesel in here. And basically, a motor, or basically the motor as a whole, is pretty much bulletproof. You you really can't have too many problems with it. Certain things like water pumps, they can obviously tend to go because we've obviously got rubber seals in there. They tend to perish. Fan belts, some of them can be a little bit sketchy too. So that's obviously something that's worth replacing. But one of the key things that I've sort of come across is your brake master cylinder and your clutch master cylinder and slave cylinder. And basically, because of a lot of these vehicles, yes, they had a lot of use, maybe at one point, but they spent a lot of time sitting around not doing much. Probably because Australia hasn't been invaded, it, well, never been invaded technically. So it means they haven't seen a lot of action. And because these, uh, the brake master cylinder and the clutch master cylinder are made out of, uh, I guess, an aluminium manganese alloy, the brake fluid slowly corrodes this over time and metal fragments obviously get stuck in the bottom of the reservoir in the master cylinder itself. And when that happens, that obviously scores the seal, it scores the actual cylinder itself, and then it causes the master cylinder to fail. Also, rubber over time, as we've discussed in regards to the fan belt, goes brittle. And the biggest thing against these vehicle vehicles is time. You know, this vehicle here is essentially 33 years old. And for its age, it's in fantastic condition, but you can't get away from the fact it is a 33 year old vehicle. So all your rubbers, all your perishable items, that's the things that you really wanna look for. You know, um, shock absorber bushes, particularly on this one, they were okay, but you could even see that there were signs of sort of perishing around the actual bush itself. And you know, that's not a make and break in regards to buying the vehicle, that's just something that's going to need to be replaced relatively soon down the track. Everything else in the vehicle is pretty much A-OK. -okay. There's not a huge, I guess, no, big red flags to sort of look out for. As I've said, it's mainly rubber items. 
checking your radiator hoses, checking your engine mounts, and that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all you've got to look out for. Okay, so the next port of call, and this is one that I think is very, very important, and was actually brought to my attention by a good friend of mine, Ben Broder, at Goldfields Off-Road, because he's a bit of a Land Rover aficionado too, is the transmission. Now the transmission in these is a LT95, but it's a LT95A I believe. And obviously it's got a few little Australian military, I guess, uh, modifications to it. And this is fine, this is fine, it's not a problem at all. But one of the big things with the LT95 is the centre differential. Now there's a shaft in the centre differential itself. And this is something that you can kind of pick up when you take one of these for a bit of a test drive. What you want to do is you want to put it in first gear and then you just want to slowly release the clutch out till you sort of get that friction point. And what you want to be feeling for is, is there a bit of play, is there a bit of a clunk within the transmission itself? Now, it's not a definitive answer, but it's something well worth obviously checking out because if you're hearing a bit of a, a bit of a clunk, a bit of a, a bit of a twisting motion, then that's a pretty good indication that there is some kind of significant wear within the actual center differential itself. Now this isn't a big deal, anything can be fixed on these vehicles, but it does come down to obviously, are you going to do it yourself, give it a go, or are you going to pay someone else to do it? And that's obviously going to determine how much extra money you need to put aside to actually do it. Because the slop in the actual center differential itself, if it is abused, can obviously manifest into actually snapping that shaft. And when that shaft snaps, you've got no drive. Not to the rear, not to the front of the vehicle. And the vehicle itself is stricken. And that is number one in regards to the Achilles heel for this vehicle. All four wheel drives have one, even Land Cruisers. I know it's hard to believe, but it is true. The next sort of Achilles heel in regards to these vehicles is obviously the Rover differential in the front. Now, I haven't had any problems with it, knock on. We'll use that instead of wood. But basically what can happen is there is a fusion fit pin within the, I guess, diff center or the spider gears as some people call them. And this can actually drop out and actually cause the differential to essentially collapse or lock up. And obviously you're gonna know about it because all four wheels will lock up violently uh, on the tarmac or on your track. But, you know, I don't know how common it is. I've heard one person have that issue and you know, I've done close to 65,000 kilometers in this vehicle over tough terrain and as I said, haven't had a problem, but it's something to be mindful of. Okay, so one of the other things that you want to look out for is actually in regards to the doors. Now, this one here has done a lot throughout, it, throughout its life and it's obviously spent a bit of time outside. It's not too bad on this side, but we have got signs of electrolysis down here or the, the dreaded rot. Now, you can actually get door bottoms for these. It's not too hard. I was able to pick up a couple, um, but then you've got to go to the trouble of actually respraying it and trying to get it to match the pre-existing paintwork, which I guess, I don't know, I'm a bit finicky about that. I like to keep things looking relatively good. Uh, in regards to the interior of the vehicle, one of the things you want to look out for is obviously the dash top. With the Series 3, as we know, they're notorious for cracking, and when it came round to doing the county or the parenti, they did nothing in regards to the vinyl. And because we're here in Australia and we're probably five, six metres away from the sun, uh, and we've got lovely, lovely ozone hole that's slowly doing its thing, uh, they tend to crack like nothing else. So you can put vinyl repairs on them, people put marine matting, people do all kinds of things, but to be honest, just cut your losses. I think it's about $400. They're not cheap, I know, but you can essentially just buy a brand new top, take the old one off, put it back on. So that's one thing to look for. 
Another thing to look for is the instrument cluster. Behind this is actually a plastic mounting bracket or plate. And being obviously hangover from British Leyland, the plastic is pretty much, you know, not that great. And so this actually tends to crack and break. And so the actual instrument cluster itself will essentially just sit there and just rattle around and do nothing. And that's, that's okay if you're just pottering around on nice smooth roads, but once you get on corrugations, it actually shakes all the instrument clusters to pieces. And I actually had this happen to me, and it actually destroyed my speedo or speedometer. And I actually had to take that out, send it away, get it rebuilt, get it back. And essentially what I've done is I've got the guys at Goldfields Off-Road because they did all the work on this for our last major trip to take the instrument cluster out and actually fit a tin or steel uh, mounting plate behind it, which is a pretty easy optional extra to source. And so that way, the instruments here, they're never ever going to move and I don't have to worry about replacing you know, plastic brackets constantly. So that's probably about everything in regards to the interior. Well, one more thing I should, should note, as I said, you know, these really haven't done a lot of work. I bought this one with 110,000 kilometers on the clock. But what you can actually look at is for, <clears throat> what you can actually look for is where. They may have not done many kilometers as this hasn't, but this was a radio vehicle. So the engine has been running, you know, for quite a long time. It's got an hour meter. And what you can actually do is get the hours and then just even at, at the auction house just do a little bit of arithmetic on your phone or whatever and you can figure out how much actual work this has done how much run time has actually gone on the vehicle if you're not that way inclined you can just simply have a look at the doors look at the doors look at the actual um, the mats look at the actual seat box and you can look for scuff marks and you can also look to see where the actual two-pack paint because that's what these are actually uh, painted with has actually gone from a matte finish to almost slightly polished where people have just hopped in and out and that gives you just a little bit of an idea of how much work this vehicle's actually done obviously with this vehicle too keeping on the paint theme uh, the paint's pretty faded so it's spent a lot of time out in the sun some of the vehicles uh, obviously most of these came into service in the 1980s but later on in 1997, I believe, a lot of them went back, were refitted, rebuilt, and ready to go for another decade. So obviously the paintwork on them is, you know, pristine. It's almost like brand new. But I'd say that this one's probably an original. Uh, anyway, we'll go around to the back of the vehicle and I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things to look for there. And that'll probably wrap it up. One thing you need to look for doesn't matter where you purchase the vehicle is getting the log book and I'll just go get this and I'll show you what I mean. Rightio, so when it comes to actually purchasing one of these vehicles uh, on the actual websites whether it's um, Pickles or Grays Online, sorry got to think off the top of my head here, what you want to look for is this. There'll actually be a mention in the actual advertisement whether it's got a logbook or not. And this is absolute gold. And, and for me, this is one of the reasons why I bought this vehicle. I bought the vehicle because there was no damage to it. It was pretty much completely clean. It was registered as a GS and turned out to be an FFR, but that doesn't really matter. But it was the logbook. And basically, this logbook has everything absolutely everything that was done to the vehicle it's got instructions in regards to what to do with the vehicle and it's got the units that it served served with it's got the parts that were required to actually do the work on it technical specifications absolutely everything so I can trace this back to day dot now with that obviously I can look at the units that it served with and if you're, you know, like doing a little bit of research, you can actually potentially find out where it may have seen service overseas. So you can kind of piece together its history. And I think that's really, really cool. 
But one of the other things with this, particularly if you're, you know, and there's no, no problem if you are not mechanically minded, is you can find a really helpful Land Rover specialist, and that's really what you want to go to. You don't want to go to your average mechanic, you want to go to a Land Rover specialist. And what you can do is you can say, I've purchased this vehicle at an auction, I know nothing about Land Rovers, keen to learn, here's the logbook. And at least the mechanic has a place to start, and they can actually look through this and they can figure out exactly what the vehicle's done, what when it got done too, because it may have a new clutch in it, but that was done 20 years ago. And the main seal at, or the rear main seal may have failed and oil's just going all over it. So they can decipher what's been done and they can give you a good indication of what needs to be done in the future to that vehicle. So that's very important. Another thing that's really important to look for that I nearly forgot to mention, and I'll leave it here, is the little green sticker on the windscreen. Now this is a inspection that I believe is carried out every 12 months for any military vehicle. And basically they go through, it's pretty thorough, and see whether the vehicle needs any major repairs. And if it's okay, and obviously some people are more fastidious than others and some people do the tick and flick, but majority of the time they're pretty good. If everything's well with a the vehicle, they'll get a fully functional sticker. So if you see that and it's dated correctly for pretty close to when you're actually purchasing the vehicle, then you know that the vehicle's not too bad, you know, and just gives you a little bit more confidence. So that's certainly one thing I would look out for. Rightio, well, hopefully you found this video of use to you and there's a few obviously tips and tricks and things that you may have not known, a few things that you hadn't thought of. And obviously I haven't covered everything in this video. Uh, we'd be here for hours if I did. But look, if you've got some tips and tricks that you'd like to share with myself or others, then please leave a comment down below. Because, you know, we all want to have a vehicle that we can enjoy and obviously we want to make sure that we're buying the best possible vehicle that we can with the money that we have at hand. But anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this and if you are enjoying the content here at Seriously Series then please do check us out on Patreon. All proceeds go to the production of these videos and a heck of a lot more. And if you're new to the channel, click on that subscribe button down below, click on that notification button too and that way you won't miss out on one single video. Anyway, hope to see you in our next video.